Hello, my name is Douglas Allen, and I'm the Burnaby Mountain Professor of Economics at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. That title makes it sound like I'm a ski instructor. I'm a pretty good skier, but I've also spent my adult life worried about questions of how exchange, production, and life in general is organized. I've worked in a number of areas, including theory, marriage, the family, farming, and economic history. Most recently, I wrote the book, The Institutional Revolution, Measurement and the Economic Emergence of the Modern World, which won the 2014 Douglas North Book Prize. Over the course of my short talks, I want to explain what I consider are some fundamental aspects of institutional economics and essential ingredients in recognizing and explaining institutional puzzles. In this first lecture, I'm going to talk about efficiency and the role it plays in recognizing puzzles around us. The controversial point that I want to make is that the concept of efficiency is not a tool for improving the world around us, but rather is just a constraint on the economist. Now let me repeat that. Efficiency is a constraint on the economist. Now, what do I mean by that? The most fundamental idea in economics has to do with motivation. Why do people do the things that they do? We assume in every economic model that everyone is a maximizer. That is, we assume everyone does the best they can under the circumstances they face. Hence, if any economic model leads to an equilibrium where some type of deadweight loss or inefficiency exists, there must be a logical problem with the model. It's just not possible for all agents in a model to do the best they can, and yet in equilibrium, fail to do so. Now, I'm not the first person to notice this. Stephen Chung, in his great book on shared tenancy, states, efficiency is a condition of market equilibrium, logically deduced. It is a positive term devoid of welfare implications. And perhaps Armin Elchian put it best when he said, a constrained maximum is efficient by definition. Let's consider the simplest of examples, the case of a single price monopoly. Here we have consumers maximizing their surplus, firms maximizing their profits, and yet each leaves money on the table in the form of a deadweight loss. They were both maximizers, and yet they failed to maximize. Something has to be wrong here. As Michael Statton and John Umbeck have pointed out, the term efficient means only that the economist has sufficiently constrained the maximization process with enough assumptions to generate a logical theoretical implication. Therefore, inefficient can mean only that the economist has failed logically to derive his theory. Now, of course, in the context of the single price monopoly, the logical failure is obvious. The firm is constrained to charge only one price. Since this constraint does not show up in the graph, it looks like there's a deadweight loss when in fact, there is not. If we start with the assumption that everyone is doing the best they can under the circumstances they face, then the equilibrium of such a model must be efficient in a constrained sense. It is, as Alchian pointed out, just a matter of definition. Well, so what? Well, it actually changes everything. Once we have this perspective, once we start looking at the world this way, then rather than declaring various behaviors as inefficient and follow this up with some sort of policy recommendation, the economist should see the costly behavior as a puzzle. If there is an apparent inefficient institution, then this is an institutional puzzle. In other words, if there is some behavior that continues, despite obvious enormous costs, then there must be some type of offsetting benefit that allows it to survive, and we just haven't noticed that benefit yet. One of the great contributions of institutional economics has been the introduction 
of the concept of transactions costs, which provides the key to such an analysis. We'll explore this idea in the next two lectures, but let's finish this point with an example. In the institutional revolution, I consider the practice of the duel of honor. Virtually every social scientist who has examined this practice passes judgment on it. It is clearly ridiculous to have a pistol fight at dawn over a trivial slight. It's beyond inefficient. Many claim that it is crazy or immoral. But in my book, I take a different approach. The aristocrats who dueled in the pre-modern era were just as self-interested as anyone alive today. They knew what they were doing, and the practice of dueling existed for hundreds of years. It involved seconds and doctors at the duel. There was a referee who enforced well-defined rules. There must have been a logic behind it. In my book, I explain how dueling was a productive screening device and how this explains all the features of dueling. For example, why did the outcome not matter? Why were letters of apology drafted ahead of time and then given afterwards? Why were only a few people allowed to duel and not others? And why was the duel held in private but then publicly announced? But the idea of coming up with an explanation for dueling would not have happened if I had started with the idea that it was inefficient. Calling things inefficient is a result of a logical failure and one that acts as a huge stop sign for further inquiry. As Ronald Coase once said, the desire to be of service to one's fellows is no doubt a noble motive, but it is not possible to influence policy if you do not give an answer. Our first job as economists is to try to understand the world around us. And we can't start that job if we think we already know all the answers. The concept of efficiency constrains us and should prevent us from the easy way out of declaring something inefficient just because we don't like it or it is inconsistent with our model, our personal biases, or our way of thinking.